Good morning, church. So out of curiosity, good morning. Um, who has that, does that yellow van that's out there belong to someone in this church, out of curiosity? Okay, I, maybe not, or you don't want to admit it. I just want to say that someday when I grow up, I want to own a van just like that. So that is really, really cool. I hope to be cool someday, but you know, for now, I, I settle for. Are you serious? Dude. Neil, that is, that is very cool. You're like, cool points just jumped up significantly in my eyes. So, uh, good morning and welcome to Awaken Church. Over the course of the past seven months of quarantining, I, I mean, maybe you're with me, COVID has been a real drag, right? And believe it or not, one of the things that has been roaming around in your pastor's minds and hearts is we have been looking forward to what it might look like when we're all able to get together again with some sense of normalcy and have a little party. I mean, seriously, this is something that we've had discussions about. We looked at Dave and Buster's as maybe being a great place or a main event as a fun place to have that party. I just want to let you know that we're thinking about it. It's not yet time, but we're going to hopefully, by God's grace, see that happen. So party's been on my mind a bit recently, and maybe part of the reason for that is because the book of the Bible that we're going to spend most of our time in this morning begins with a party and actually ends with a party. So I don't know how many of you all just have a guess on what book that might be, but um, most of y'all know that we are in the fourth week of our series entitled Identity Theft. And over the course of this series, our focus has been on taking a deeper look at the different ways our identity as Christians, our identity in Christ, has been compromised. And instead of looking at who God has made us to be, too many Christians today instead are choosing to look around at the world around us to define our worth, and we get buried underneath the world's expectations. And the result is that as Christians, we're living lives that are missing out on all that God has for us. Instead, what we've chosen to do is covet what other people have, as Cain did Abel, to compare ourselves to one another, as Rachel did with Leah. And then as we shared last week with the example of King Saul, many of us have our identities compromised because, and don't live up to all that God has for us because our, we let our own insecurities get in the way. And God wants better for us. That's what this series is about, to recognize that God wants more for us than oftentimes we imagine for ourselves. God tells us in the Bible that we are his new creations, that he has lovingly crafted each of us in our mother's womb, that we are faithfully and wonderfully made, and that God has great plans for us. If we'd only stop letting our own small thinking get in the way. So this week, we're going to swing in the opposite direction. Instead of small thinking, we're going to focus on a character in the Bible who cannot ever be accused of small thinking, which is actually his problem. His name is Haman, and before we get into the story, I want to share a couple of things. First, uh, this is, uh, as you know, if you've been with us the past four weeks, this is an Awakened Q&A series, which means that if during the course of the teaching you have any questions, comments, or thoughts, go ahead and feel free to text them to awakenedqna at gmail.com, and I would love to, at the end of our time, take a few minutes to tackle them. Uh, secondly, beyond Q&A, I would like to ask you all for help this morning. Uh, for those of you who are in the congregation and also for our awakened kids who are part of streaming the service today, and here's how you can help. Uh, or actually, before I tell you about how you can help, I need to tell you uh, about a celebration, a party, a festival called the Feast of Purim. Purim is a Hebrew celebration that can probably be best be described or imagined as like a Jewish Mardi Gras. So in this uh, Feast of Purim, there is dressing up, 
there's typically a lot of drinking and uh, partying. And so uh, that is kind of what embodies this holiday. But the other key element of Purim is that there is a telling, a public telling of the story of Esther. And which is why I need your help. So as we're going through the book of Esther today, one of the traditions that's tied to the Feast of Purim is as I'm telling the story of Esther, whenever I share the name Haman, everybody drowns out his name by saying boo or hiss or stomp your feet, right? That's what you do whenever I say the word Haman. Good. And in addition to booing and hissing, uh, the, the Jewish people have these things called graggers, right? Which none of us have, but you've been given noisemakers. A number of you came in the church, little noisemakers. So every time I say, and for you kids at home, uh, every time I say the word Haman, you guys are to hiss, stomp your feet, and, and, and swing your little graggers or your little noisemakers. So that's kind of what we're going to do as we tell the story. And one final thing for you awakened kids. So we're not going to have any drawings today or any works of art. Instead, what I'm going to ask you to do is really quick, go back into your room or somewhere and dress up in something fun. And then when you come back, you get a little noisemaker, not too loud because your parents are going to kill me, but just get a little noisemaker. And every time as you're listening to this morning's teaching, whenever you hear the word Haman, then you go ahead, hiss, good, stomp your feet and make a little bit of noise. So go ahead and go do that now. Don't worry, you're not going to miss anything. Uh, While you're gone and dressing, I'm just going to give everyone else a little bit of background on the story, okay? So for everyone else, uh, the story and the book of Esther begins with a party. And uh, thrown by a king, King Xerxes. In some versions, it says King Ahasuerus. It's the same guy. And so this is the party to end all parties. It's a celebration that takes place over 180 days. That's like six months. That's like as long as almost we've been in quarantine. So that's how long this celebration has been, filled with eating and drinking and partying. And then after the 180 days are over, that's not enough. King Xerxes extends by another seven days uh, feasting in his castle, right, in his fortress, where poor and rich alike are allowed to come in There's going to be plenty of food and plenty of drinking. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that King Xerxes actually issues an edict that says it is not legal to put any limits on the amount of drinking we're going to be doing. So that's what type of party is happening here. And then on the seventh day, so after 187 days of partying, we're coming to the end. King Xerxes uh, is sitting down with some of his close friends and and admirers, and he decides to call his queen to come to him because she's incredibly beautiful, and he wants to show her off. There's a problem. She doesn't come out. She says, nope, sorry, check you later, king, so or hubby. And the Bible doesn't necessarily tell us why, she doesn't come out. But you can probably assume that after 187 days of having to dress up, put on all your makeup, and look all pretty simply to sashay and prance around for the admirers of the king, she's done. I've had enough. I just can't do it anymore. Unfortunately, this leads to uh, embarrassment, humiliation, for the king, and eventually rage. He and his advisors sit together and say, uh, this can't happen. What will happen if other families hear about what your wife has done? And so it launches this, the, what happens next is a rejection of Queen Vashti and a search throughout the kingdom for the next queen. And so during this search, there is a young Jewish woman whose name is Esther, who ends up being the one who pleases King Xerxes the most. Esther is a young Jewish woman who has been raised by her cousin Mordecai as if she was his own daughter after her parents die. So her parents have died while she was quite young. She is raised by her cousin Mordecai, and she is the one chosen to be the next 
queen uh, to King Xerxes. And Mordecai is, um, has its place. He works at the palace gate. And at one time, Mordecai, as, as a little note, is responsible for foiling an assassination attempt on the king. So he's actually done something quite recognizable as well. And so these are the players, King Xerxes, Queen Esther, and Mordecai, her cousin. And Mordecai is also the one who has told Queen Esther to hide your heritage and to keep your background a secret. Don't tell anyone where you have come from. All right? So that's the story. That's the context. All of the players have been introduced, King Xerxes, Queen Esther, Mordecai, all except one. And he is introduced in Esther chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Sometime later, King Xerxes promoted Haman, son of Hamadatha the Agagite, over all the other nobles, making him the most powerful official in the empire. All the king's official would bow down before Haman to show him respect whenever he passed by, for so the king had commanded. But Mordecai refused to bow down or show him respect. So this is the final character, uh, main character in the story. He is the villain. His name is Haman, and he is an Agagite, right? So quick trivia for you Bible nerds. Last week we talked about King Saul, if you remember. And how many of you remember why King Saul was rejected as king of Israel? It was because he wouldn't completely destroy a group of people called the Amalekites. Do you guys remember this? So he would not completely destroy the Amalekites, even though God told him, destroy everyone, animals, uh, all of a, a man, woman, child, whatever the case may be, to completely destroy the Amalekites. King Saul didn't do so. He spared some, including King Agag himself, right? Um, so Haman, it says here in the scripture, is an Agagite, which means he is the great, great grandson of King Agag, the person that Saul spared but should never have spared. So in other words, if King Saul had simply completely obeyed God, the entire threat of Haman could have been avoided. And what was that threat? Verses five to six. When Haman, good job, saw that Mordecai would not bow down or show him respect, he was filled with rage. He had learned of Mordecai's nationality, so he decided it was not enough to lay hands on Mordecai alone. Instead, he looked for a way to destroy all the Jews throughout the entire empire of Xerxes. So the threat is the elimination of the Jewish people. That is what is at stake here, which is what the Amalekites always wanted to do and why God called for their complete extermination, right? King Saul's lack of complete obedience to God generations earlier has led to threat to Esther and her people in their day. You know, I know this is an aside, and this is not where we're going to spend our sermon, but I just want to take a moment and go there if it's okay. I think this is a really important lesson for us to understand and learn as Christians today. There is a real temptation today, and maybe it's always been this way, for Christians to only offer partial obedience to God. Partial obedience to God's commands. And what that means, and whether that, that has to do with sex before marriage, or abortion issues, or divorce, or cheating on taxes, or lying, or whatever the case may be, there can be a tendency among God's people to obey up until the point where it's no longer convenient, or we feel like it's no longer acting in our own personal interest. And partial obedience, and I want to note too that when we partially obey, and again, we've all done it to some extent, when we partially obey God, it's not because we hate God, it's not because we don't like God, it's not even typically because we think God's commands are bad, right? But because we think we know better, and catch this, because many times we don't see the harm in our partial obedience, and the reason for that is because what we often see is so limited. 
King Saul had the same problem. He didn't see the harm in sparing the king. He was going to kill him anyway, just not in the moment. He didn't see the reason to waste all of these animals. In his mind, he couldn't see the harm. But God sees in a way that is unlike how we see. God sees over the span of generations, and we do not. And this is why when God calls us to complete obedience, we have to understand that our complete obedience isn't simply for our sake, but for the sake of what God sees as negative consequences throughout. Right. So this is, this is just, just an aside. I don't want to spend a lot of time there, but this is why it is important for us as Christians to be reminded that there is complete obedience is what we've been called to. Anyway, enough of a detour. So here's Haman. Yep. And proud of the honor that King Xerxes has given him. Uh, he loves when people, wherever he goes, that people are bowing and showing him respect. He loves it. He thinks he has earned it. He thinks he deserves it. And most notably, he gets upset when he doesn't get the recognition he thinks he deserves. That's how you know when a person is proud, isn't it? Not just simply the fact that I look for appreciation and recognition and maybe even go out of my way to do so, but then I get angry or hurt when I don't get what I think I deserve. Uh, the book of Proverbs shares it this way. Fire tests the purity of silver and gold, but a person is tested by being praised. Another version says a man is tested by the praise he receives. Uh, that's what God says is the way what tests the truth of a woman's heart, the truth of a man's heart. And when Haman doesn't get the praise he thinks he deserves, his intention, what that hatred and hurt causes him to do is not simply seek to destroy Mordecai, but all of his people, all of the Jews, which he considered to be his enemy anyway, as a descendant of Agag, as an Agagite. Well, somehow Mordecai discovers Haman's plots. That's right, Haman's plots. And so he approaches his cousin, Esther the queen. And Esther's response is, Mordecai, I don't know what this necessarily has to do with me. I'm the queen. I'm not his advisor. He doesn't come to me for advice. As a matter of fact, if I enter his presence without his permission, the, the law says I am to be killed unless he extends to me his golden scepter. But he hasn't called me in 30 days. What do you expect me to do? And here's Mordecai's response in Esther 4, starting in verse 13. Mordecai sent this reply to Esther, don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace, you will escape when all other Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place, but you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, go and gather together all of the Jews of Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will do the same. And then though it is against the law, I will go in to see the king. If I must die, I must die. Amen, right? I've read through the Bible multiple times. The entire scriptures, multiple times. I've, I've seen countless TV shows, countless movies. I've read a whole slew of books. And this quote from Esther is one of, if not the most courageous words ever spoken by a young woman, untested. Esther, unlike her counterpart, Haman, is not proud she does not think highly of herself, but she also doesn't see herself any more lowly than she could either. She's looking at the reality of her situation. She understands the difficulty of the task in front of her, and she embraces her charge with courage. That is humility. And then she does what she says. She approaches the king uninvited, knowing that if he doesn't extend his golden scepter out to her, he's going to be looking for another queen. Fortunately, he does so. She approaches the king, and 
she, instead of asking for her people's deliverance with wisdom and humility, she instead invites her and Haman over for dinner. Afterwards, Esther chapter 5 and verse 9. Haman was a happy man as he left the banquet. Oh, yeah, missed that one. Uh, But when he saw Mordecai sitting at the palace gate, not standing up or trembling nervously before him, Haman became furious. However, he restrained himself and went on home. Then Haman gathered together his friends and Zeresh, his wife, and boasted to them about his great wealth, about his many children. He bragged about the honors the king had given him and how he had been promoted over all the other nobles and officials. Then Haman added, and that's not all. Queen Esther invited only me and the king himself to the banquet she prepared for us. And she's invited me to dine with her and the king again tomorrow. Then he added, but this is all worth nothing as long as I see Mordecai, that Jew, just sitting there at the palace gate. All right, that was a nice extended passage. But this is a series on identity. So just as a question, don't actually raise your hands, but how many of us, if we think about it, know someone like this, right? Someone who craves recognition and honor. So as an example, someone who craves recognition and honor might be a type of person that brags, like Haman does, all the time about how indispensable they are at their job and how everyone around them at work is just incompetent and lost without them. How many of us know someone who can't get enough of being admired, which is why they're always boasting, sometimes subtle bragging, humble bragging, about all how much money they have, how many things they buy, what they buy, right? Um, All the vacations they take, uh, emphasizing how good they look or what clothes they have or how fancy their things are. Or maybe how many of us know someone who always seems to take credit for things that don't have anything to do with them? Uh, An example might be, uh, look, I'm a success because I work for one of the biggest companies in the world. So what? What does that have to do with you? Do you understand that these are people that take credit, they boast about things, um, and they're not humble, right? People who, who are like this struggle with the sin called pride. And prideful people are the ones who are taking the measuring sticks of the world to prove to you how much they're worth. They're taking the measuring sticks of the world to prove to you how much they are worth. And that is what Haman is doing here. He gathers his wife, he gathers his friends, he gathers his advisors together, and he's boasting about his privilege He's bragging about the things to which he's entitled to, completely unaware of the effect it has on the people around him. And then when he sees someone like Mordecai, who isn't impressed by all of his privilege and wealth and things, and, his, and sees through all of his pretentiousness and conceit, he and doesn't decide to idolize him, Haman is a Offended and furious. So I recently read this fun story about two ducks and a frog. So these two ducks and a frog, they're all best friends. And they're best friends in this little private pond that no one else knows about except them. And every single day, these two ducks and the frog, they kind of play with each other. Unfortunately, uh, there came this really, really hot summer. And this really, really hot summer dried up the pond, and there was no water left, and they decided they need to move to find another pond, which is not a problem for the two ducks, because the two ducks can can fly. But it is a little bit of a problem for their frog friend, their friend frog, frog friend, right? So what they decide to do is very clever. They get a stick, and each of the ducks gets a stick between its little bill And in between, the frog is able to jump up and use his mouth to clamp onto that stick. And then the ducks are able to fly. And it works. So the two ducks are flying in the air with this little stick between them, and the frog has its mouth clamped on that stick, holding on as they fly. And it is impressive. As a matter of fact, it's so impressive that a farmer sees them, looks up in admiration, and says, well, 
Isn't that a really clever idea? I wonder who thought of that. And then the frog opened his mouth and said, I did. Okay. In the book of Proverbs, in case you missed it, pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. You know, the frog opened his mouth and fell. Okay, so just making sure pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. For this frog, that fall was literal, and for Haman... His fall is coming. Esther 6, 6. So Haman came in. You guys are so good. And the king said, what should I do to honor a man who truly pleases me? Haman, that's right, thought to himself, whom would the king want to honor more than me? So the king was, uh, in context, the king was having some difficulty sleeping one night. And so he decides the smart thing to do if you're having difficulty sleeping is to read history. Okay, so anyway, he decides to read some history, and, uh, but he decides to read some history about himself and his own reign because he's kind of self-centric too. And as he's reading a little bit of history about his own reign, he comes across this story that we talked about earlier of Mordecai. Uh, thwarting this assassination attempt. And so he looks around at his different advisors and says, hey, what was ever done for this Mordecai guy for thwarting that assassination attempt against me? And his advisors say, "Uh, nothing was ever done. At that point in time, Haman (laughs) happened to be walking by, upset still, distressed still at the fact that Mordecai had not chosen to honor him, even though the king's edict said he must. And so he was coming by, preparing to ask the king to have Mordecai killed. The king calls him in and and said and asked him this question, what should I do to honor a man who truly pleases me? And Haman, because he's prideful, thinks, well, of course, if the king's going to honor anyone, it must be me. And so he responds by sharing all of the things that a man who is honored by the king should receive, to be seated on his horse, to wear the king's robe. He comes up with this elaborate scheme or this elaborate presentation, and then imagine his horror when the king looks at him and says, great idea. Haman I want you to go and make sure that everything you have said is done for Mordecai. Imagine his horror, and now he is forced to go out and do all the things that he wanted to be honored with and by for this man, Mordecai, whom he despises. And afterwards, it says this in Esther verse, chapter 6, verse 12. Afterwards, Mordecai returned to the palace gate, but Haman hurried home dejected and completely humiliated, because that's what we do when we're humiliated, we run home. When Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends what had happened, his wise advisors and his wife said, Since Mordecai, this man who has humiliated you, is of Jewish birth, you will never succeed in your plans against him. It would be fatal to continue opposing him. Wow. I don't want you to miss what happens right here in this passage. Because the people around Haman, his wife, his friends and his advisors are finally starting to see what he cannot, that pride is going to lead to his destruction, which is a bit crazy, isn't it? Because people like Haman in our world today, instead of being pitied, we tend to think of them as being privileged, as being blessed. How else do we think of people that when everything they do seems to turn into gold. They must be doing something right if everything keeps going their way. That's how we tend to think. When we see someone's life where everything seems to be going their way, we're like, oh, they're blessed. They're great. They, something must be right about them. But when you use blessing and privilege to serve no one other than yourself, then you're going against God's intent. 
And in the New Testament, the Apostle James gives people like that, Christians like that, a warning. In James chapter 4, as the scriptures say, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So, humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. James warns Christians that this is what happens, Christian, when you grow proud and you choose to allow your privilege or the things that you have to cause you to elevate yourself and to benefit no one besides yourself. You will find yourself in opposition to God. And that is a place no one wants to be. Haman doesn't see it. Even when everyone else around him, his wife, his friends, and his advisors, they all see the danger of his pride, he does not. He will not. Pride. So in a few minutes, we're going to be wrapping up. And as we're wrapping up, I just want to remind you, if you have any questions, comments, or thoughts on this story as you've heard it, go ahead and send them in to awakenqna at gmail.com. I'm actually curious what your thoughts are up to this point. And we'll go ahead and tackle those in just a few. So you know, when I was a, uh, a young Christian uh, in the Orlando Chinese Church, so I'd only been saved about a year or so, I used to attend this Friday night Bible study. And uh, so... Again, Chinese church is a bit different than church here at Awaken. Chinese church, you show up at about 8.30 in the morning, and you leave about 1 in the afternoon. That's just how Chinese church works. And then Friday night Bible studies weren't that much better. It usually go for two and a half to three hours. And so I would go sometimes out of obligation, but more often because I just needed to learn. I needed to grow, and the people who were discipling me and mentoring me said, you should show up at these things. So I did show up. I listened kind of. I sometimes fell asleep a bit and zoned out, but there was one thing that was shared that I distinctly remember one of the elders in the church uh, was sharing during that time and really got my attention by asking me this question, or asking all of us this question. And the question he asked was, what sin is the worst sin you can commit? What sin is the worst sin you can commit? So I'm a young Christian. I'm thinking, that's a fascinating question. And I thought, well, murder? Eh. Rape? Eh. Uh, mass murder? Ooh, genocide. Like, that has to be the worst sin. And all of my answers were wrong. All of our answers were wrong. And the elder said, no, 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 that's not it. The worst sin you can commit is pride. Do you know Why? Because every other sin you commit, whether it be murder, adultery, or worse, if you repent of that sin, if you humble yourself before God, and you ask God for forgiveness, the scriptures tell us that he will forgive you. There might still be consequences. God's forgiveness doesn't mean you don't have to go to jail, but it does mean that you can be made right with God if you repent and if you humble yourself and you ask for forgiveness. That is true of every sin except pride. Pride, by definition, is the one sin that keeps you from doing the one thing that is necessary for you to receive God's grace and forgiveness. You can either be proud or you can humble yourself and receive God's forgiveness and mercy, but you cannot do both. The very nature of pride says, I will not humble myself. And that is why it is the worst of sins. How about you? Do you have a problem with pride? I mean, I know to some extent we've all struggled with pride. That's a very different thing. That's like saying, you know, um, are you an alcoholic because I have a drink on occasion once a week, all right? That's not, they're not the same thing. Do you have a problem with pride? And if you're not sure, I've drafted up four little questions to ask yourself that might help evaluate whether or not pride is something I struggle with. The first question do you use the words I and me a lot? Like, you don't even think of words like we and us. You use I and me often in conversation. Second, do you go out of your way to get recognition? 
Do you go out of your way to get recognition? Like you are, you actually make an extra effort. You make a certain comment that will draw attention to yourself. You do little things to try and get extra recognition. And on top of that, in addition to that, do you have a difficult time celebrating the accomplishments of others? Because if you do these two things, I go a little bit out of my way to get that extra attention. And when someone else gets the attention, when not someone else gets recognition of the spotlight, I'm a little bit resentful. If so, you might have a pride problem. Third, are you self-absorbed? And let's define what self-absorbed means. It means I am consistently putting myself and my needs and my interests and my desires first. In fact, even when I'm in conversation with someone else, I'm just listening to the other person simply to find an opening where I can talk about myself again, right? That's self-absorbed. So do I use I and me a lot? Do I go out of my way to get recognition and kind of resent when someone else does? Am I self-absorbed? And finally, do I take credit for shared accomplishments and for the accomplishments of others? This is something really interesting about prideful people, that accomplishments that we've done together, I take credit for. Or even sometimes the accomplishments of others, if I feel like it was prompted by my idea or my thoughts, I'll take credit for that too. And in addition to that, not only do I take credit for accomplishments and for good things, but I refuse to take recognition or credit for failure. As a matter of fact, I push blame for failure on other people. So I take credit when things go well, and I push failure onto others. That is also a sign of pride. C.S. Lewis once shared, pride is ruthless, sleepless, unsmiling concentration on the self. Pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the other person. We live in a world bloated with pride, and God warns us that when our pride bleeds into our identity, uh, or, or pride bleeds into our identity by causing us to think we're better than we really are. Because then when we put ourselves, when pride bleeds into our identity by causing us to think that we're better than we really are, we're putting ourselves in a place opposite God. And that's what the scriptures say is that's not where you want to be. That's not where you want to find yourself in a place where God is opposing you. Whereas humility, the opposite of pride, says we see ourselves rightly in relationship with God. Not in relationship with another person, but in relationship with God. Because that is where our identity is supposed to come from. Who we are as seen through the eyes of God. Pride, by contrast, is a threat to our identities because it refuses to give God credit, choosing instead to credit ourselves. Pride is when we take credit for what rightfully belongs to him. In the book of Romans, the author shares this warning, Romans chapter 12, verses 3 to 4. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, says Paul, I give each of you this warning. Pay attention. When God says, I give you this warning, we should pay attention. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, which is the definition of humility. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. So let me wrap up, uh, and we'll get to Q&A. Let me wrap up with sharing uh, the close, how Haman's story ends. So Queen Esther exposes Haman's plot to the king, and the king is outraged. And not so much that he's outraged, King Xerxes is outraged for the Jewish people, but he's outraged that anyone would dare threaten his wife, who has now been exposed as a Jew. Haman is killed, impaled upon a sharpened pole standing 75 feet tall. That is a bad way to die. Basically, you're placed on that pole, and your body weight over time will bring you to the bottom. But that is how Haman intended for Mordecai to be killed, and so it was quite appropriate that he was taken this way instead. Esther and the Jewish people are saved. Mordecai is appointed in Haman's last time place, 
And he is now the most powerful official in the nation under King Xerxes. And one of the things he puts into place is a, he establishes a feast of Purim. Close out with these verses, Esther 9, verses 22 to 23. He told them to celebrate these days with feasting and gladness and by giving gifts of food to each other and presents to the poor. That would commemorate a time when the Jews gained relief from their enemies, when their sorrow was turned into gladness and their mourning into joy. So the Jews accepted Mordecai's proposal and adopted this annual custom. Purim has been ever since celebrated every year, even until today, which is a testament to the work that was done in the book of Esther. And they all lived happily ever after. So, awesome. Let's go ahead and, uh, and jump in with some some Q&A. So uh, I know our time is running short. I'll just take a couple minutes. How should you respond to a friend when you give them wise advice like Haman's friends and the person Haman uh, chooses to ignore it? Um, oh, yeah. This sucks. Um, so you're giving your friend wise counsel. Uh, sometimes they've even asked for your wise counsel. And then after hearing your wise counsel, they decide to ignore it. Um, what should you do? You should punch them in the face, honestly, uh, especially if they asked you for advice and they don't listen to you. They absolutely deserve to be punched in the face. I'm, I'm kind of kidding. Um, I think wisdom and discernment is, is appropriate here because it's just difficult to just broadly. Um, I, would, I would oftentimes say that if I'm giving counsel to someone, and especially if they've initiated getting that counsel, and then they don't take it, I, would, I usually challenge them and just ask them, right? So I realize, so one of the things that just happened is you kind of asked me my input and my thoughts, and over the course of the past couple of weeks, I've noticed that you have completely ignored everything I shared. And I just kind of wanted to ask you how you felt. Uh, maybe I missed something. Was there something about what I shared with you that you couldn't accept or you had a hard time with? And ask them and see what their response is. I think, uh, again, I'd like to consistently go to 1 Thessalonians 5, right, to be able to discern are they uh, rebellious, are they needing encouragement, or are they weak, right? And I think there's a distinction. I always want to believe the best of people and believe, well, maybe you didn't understand. If I realize that you understood, then maybe I'll encourage you. And if I'm encouraging you and you're still not responding, I want to see what obstacles are keeping you from uh, being able to do so. And then finally you get to the point of if they're rebellious, then all right, I don't know if there's anything else that I can do to help you. Hopefully that kind of gave a, a bit of clarity. Uh, should you bother with non-Christians who are prideful like Haman or protect ourselves and avoid them? Don't they need Jesus just as much, if not more, than us? That's a great question. So, if I were to be, for me, right, I think in many ways, I think the reason why non-Christians are non-Christians is because of pride. Uh, far and away, I think that's the most common reason, a, a reluctance, a refusal to accept that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's not always the case. I want to be fair. There are some who it's because I didn't know. I, I believe there are legitimately people in the world who don't know Christ, and that's why we have a responsibility to share the gospel. There are others who don't understand. Uh, but then those who have heard, those who understand, and yet still continue to choose not to, uh, it's typically because of pride. I refuse to submit um, to Christ. And in that situation, I, I do feel like there is a limit to how far we can encourage them to come to Christ. Um, so if your question is, um, should we protect ourselves and avoid them? I don't know if I would frame it as that we need to protect ourselves. I think we continue to look for opportunities, but we can accept that if we've it made the invitation, and because of clearly, because of pride, they're refusing to accept Christ, then what I would just say is back off and wait for a more appropriate season to share with them again. Um, we've shared about this in church before. I think sometimes we can be like trucks, right? And we, we can tend to imagine that everything needs to be decided now. 
And oftentimes, part of wisdom says that I take the time to discern when the appropriate season is as dictated by the work of God's Holy Spirit in someone else's life because God's Spirit is the one who draws men near. That's what the Scriptures teach. And so uh, oftentimes, that season is if they're going through a time of difficulty, if they're going through a time of transition, those are usually good seasons when people are more receptive to the gospel. When I'm going through something really hard and things feel hopeless, that's when you coming to bring hope might might refresh me. When I'm going through a period of transition and I don't know what's going to happen next and there's uncertainty, I tend to be more receptive to the gospel. So that's how I would probably respond and encourage you to respond is not to feel like, all right, their rejection today is rejection forever. Um, oh man, I'm going to have to, to fly. What are practical ways to ensure you're pursuing the Lord and his will and not becoming self-righteous? prideful. Um, man looks at the outward appearance, God looks at the heart. Uh, I would say that uh, it is difficult for me on the outside to be able to discern what is in your heart. I tend to see the fruit of your life, and by that fruit, uh, as Jesus talks about, right, you shall know a tree by its fruit. I tend to, based on that fruit, assume or make assumptions about who you are. And so if the question is saying, I know right? I know my heart, and I want to be pursuing God, and I don't want to be prideful, then how do I, how do I best go about doing that? Um, I would say a couple of things. I do believe accountability, right, is always important. Have people in your life who you are not only sharing freely with, but you've given them the right to ask you the hard questions and to challenge you. I think that's a very important piece of it. This is why God has given us to live and, and thrive within the context of community. Have good people in your life who are watching out for you, willing to ask you the tough questions, and you be honest. And when I say honest, it doesn't mean I'll be honest. If they ask me the right question, I'll tell them the truth. It means I'm transparent. I'm initiating honesty with them. That's something I would say I'd encourage everyone to do, have discipleship relationships, friendships that are marked by that type of openness and trust. Um, and then I do think between you and the Lord, right, being able to say, God, am I, am, I, am I having a prideful spirit or a humble one? Am I seeing myself rightly or am I being self-willed in some way and um, seeing, thinking more of myself than I should. And I want you to realize thinking more of ourselves isn't always that we're thinking more highly of ourselves. Sometimes pride is I think more lonely of myself too. Either way, it's basically saying my view of myself trumps what God thinks of me. And that's the danger of pride. Uh, What do you do if a friend asks you for counsel and not only doesn't listen but lies to you about them? Then you should punch him in the face. And then what if your friend is very prideful and it's toxic? Do you cut ties so you don't want to get infected with that pride that is toxic? Uh, great question. I don't know necessarily what toxic means. Um, I do believe the scriptures say bad company corrupts good morals. I do think there's a place where God says if you have, quote, unquote, toxic people around you in your life that are negatively influencing you and causing you to stumble, recognize that bad company corrupts good morals. And yes, it might be appropriate to cut off ties from them. I would say I'd probably start by limiting the influence they have on your life. Um, I do believe that, like Paul says, right, we are in the world but not of the world. That is the charge we have. I just don't think it's possible to avoid all bad influences in our life and still be effectively a Christian who light shining into dark places. That's the charge that's given to us, right? That we salt and light. We bear light into dark places. We're salt to a tasteless world. In so doing, inevitably, we're going to be um, involved with people who aren't righteous and who sometimes are a bad influence upon us. I don't know if there's a way to completely avoid that. I do think we can find ways to limit their influence upon us, and that might be the first step I'd encourage you before we cut them out of our lives. Sorry, I need to wrap up. Uh, whoever's, uh, yeah, Stephen, come on up, and let me close this out in a word of prayer. Thank you guys for your questions, comments, and thoughts. You guys are the best, and thank you for uh, being a part of this morning. Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness and grace. Thank you for the story of Haman and the opportunity to see a life that we should not imitate. Lord, I, uh, I love that the scriptures give us the example of Jesus and righteous disciples and examples to follow. And honestly, sometimes it can be overwhelming 
to me and to feel like I keep trying to strive to live up to the example you set, Jesus, and I'm constantly falling short. And yet, you've also given us the opposite side, the other side, to be able to say that here are lives that are wicked and unrighteous as well. Be careful not to be like them. And uh, Lord, I pray for our saints. I pray for this church. And I pray that none of us would fall into or under the dominion of pride. We all struggle with pride at times. I pray that you draw us in humility, but um, Lord, that none of us would give ourselves over to the sin of pride and start thinking of ourselves more highly than we should or more thinking of ourselves more than we should, Lord. That we trust in how you see us and seek to align our lives with your vision for our lives and not um, what we might choose in our own self-will to see happen, Lord. We love you so much. We trust you. We follow you. We thank you. And we praise you in the name of your precious and holy son, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Frank. That, that hit me really hard. Um, I think the part that hit me the most was when you said that pride is the worst sin because it keeps us from uh, humbly approaching the throne of God and repenting. And so that is key for intimacy with the Lord. So some announcements we have. This Saturday, we are having the Seamark Ranch Mud Run. I will be going. Please join me. It's going to be wild. I was there yesterday for the work day. There's some really crazy obstacles. A mud run is basically, it's a 5K with obstacles that involve mud. It's going to be fun. Um, also, there are, there's tithes and, tithes and offerings. So if you're here, there's a mailbox in the back. Um, we believe that giving is between you and God. And you can also put your prayer requests there. If you're, at, if you're at home, you can give online, and you can also put your prayer requests online as well. So thank you guys. You're dismissed.